So this is the last of a lecture series of three in regards to COVID-19. This lecture is going to focus on treatment options, pearls and pitfalls as far as treatment of COVID. The reason it is treatment options and not just pharmaceutical options is because there are multiple treatments that are available. I want to emphasize one thing as we all know that we're in a pandemic and this started late December, early January. There hasn't been very much time to ramp up and do double-blinded placebo-controlled studies. So many of the articles you're reading or the things that are coming across Twitter or Instagram or whatever social media media avenue that we're using is not going to be what we talk about in Journal Club. This is going to be very anecdotal studies. Usually the sample sizes are going to be very, very small. So it is our responsibility for us to do what we need to do to really filter through the literature and what is available to us, what is available to us to make sure that it is the most appropriate treatment for our patients at the most appropriate time. That being said, there's gonna be no way to know that. A lot of this is gonna be hindsight when this is all said and done as far as why did we try that or why didn't we do this? And that is just something that we're gonna to have to accept and we're gonna to have to move forward with. So, Moving on in regards to treatment options, a couple things that I just wanted to touch upon right off the get-go is some of the things that are very basic and some of the things that we sometimes take for granted. For example, handheld nebulizers. These patients are usually coming in with respiratory symptoms, a lot of shortness of breath, some hypoxia. And so usually in those times, we are very quick to put patients on handheld nebulizers. And one of the biggest concerns that we found is that hospitals and pharmacies are really running a risk about running out of MDIs. Remember that we've talked about in both the lectures, lectures one and two, is we really want to avoid handheld nebulizers because of the risk of aerosolization, which is why we start reaching for our MDIs. That's not something that we usually write a lot for in the hospital. So you can imagine in this time when the surge is actually happening, we are ending up having limited supplies of these types of medications. Um, we have worked really hard with our pharmacies locally and nationally to see if there's any mechanism to increase these numbers, and we're doing a pretty good job. We've found some modalities in which you can actually still use handheld nebulizers with a very special filter, but those are in short supply too. So we are being very cautious about when we write these. So that means if you get a PUI that's up on the COVID step down or for wherever they are, if they're not wheezing, if they're not short of breath, if they're not bronchospastic, if they don't need the MDI, use your clinical judgment. Maybe we don't have to write for the MDI. Maybe we should watch them for the next four to six hours and see how they do clinically before just writing for this medication. And always, always be paying close attention to their increasing O2 needs. Do we need to adjust their oxygen from nasal cannula to high flow? Do they need BiPAP? Remember, we talked about BiPAP and CPAP. There's some concerns without making a good seal about whether that's aerosolizing those particles. So we have to be really diligent in our choice in, in regards to choosing MDIs or handheld nebulizers. So that does bring back a topic that was really discussed as far as what we call a common canister, which means essentially we would share an MDI between patients. So what do we say about common canisters? You know, we know that there are supply chain disruptions. Um, we know that some areas will only have just a few days of supply. And really this is a very precious commodity. Um, NDBI canisters usually contain enough medication to last two to four weeks. Uh, and patients we already know are gonna be hospitalized for shorter durations leading to what we consider drug waste. So a lot of hospitals started looking at common canisters to try to conserve MDI supplies. The ISMP, which we look to often to kind of give us recommendations in regards to drugs, they suggest that using a common canister is probably not appropriate for patients on isolation precautions or for immunocompromised patients. And this is why the methods used for disinfecting the mouthpiece, which is essentially using alcohol wipes in 2009, were aimed at preventing bacterial contamination. We can't apply what we do for bacteria to viruses. Obviously, they're completely two different species. And in addition, individual non-compliance will following the mouthpiece disinfection protocol is also a concern. So really most of the major colleges of pharmacy, et cetera, are not recommending common canisters during the time of the COVID pandemic. So that's kind of one of the basic things. I only bring that up because a lot of times we just have the urge to put patients on beta 
agonists and we're not really thinking if they really truly need it, but we have to be thinking about this. So let's talk about some of the other treatment options. Most of you guys are familiar with the hydroxychloroquine azithromycin rage, if you will. So plaquenil and azithromycin combination. There are a couple of mechanisms of action that are suggested as to why hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin should work. There, they talk about there being an inhibition of viral release into the host cell. Hydroxychloroquine actually blocks endosomal acidification. There is talk about reduce of viral infectivity. And then there's also a component of immune modulation. Hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine reduces toll-like receptors um, and signaling and has been shown to reduce the release of a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So we talk about A, targeting the virus, and B, we also talk about the reduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Most of you guys are used to using plaquenil in patients with lupus and dermatoid arthritis, so we know that there's already an anti-inflammatory effect. There was a small non-randomized study from France which demonstrated benefit of this combination, but there were serious methodological flaws and a follow-up study still lacked a control group. Again, like I mentioned in the beginning, we don't always necessarily have time to do control groups, but it does raise some question in regards to the study from France. There was also a trial, a couple additional trials that looked at this and they also found, hey, maybe there's some benefit, but then come along the trials equally as robust or lack thereof, and they say that the drug hasn't been shown to necessarily be uh, affected. So here's kind of the bottom line. Is it potentially an option? Yeah, sure. It is definitely potentially an option. What they're recommending really is that these should be reserved for patients that are either pending respiratory failure, um, they're on mechanical ventilation, they're on some type of non-invasive ventilation, or they're requiring supplemental oxygen via high flow nasal cannulum. So this isn't necessarily for the patient that you're seeing in the office that, yes, may have COVID or definitively has COVID, but they're doing well enough that they require no oxygen and they're just kind of going on their way. This is not someone that we want to write this combination for. This is really for the hospitalized patient and potentially even the PUI um, that looks like, hey, they really have the potential for doing poorly or they are doing poorly and we need some type of treatment modality. Like I said, there have been several trials. Some trials say, hey, there's a little bit of a benefit. Some trials equally say, hey, there's not a benefit and there's actually more risk to the patient than there is benefit. And so we're where do we balance this out? I, I don't think we know where this drug is going to have its biggest bang for the buck. A lot of people say that if we're going to use this drug, we should be using it up early instead of using it on patients that have already progressed to mechanical ventilation. So a lot is still very, very debatable about this, about this drug. In addition to that, a lot of people are using plaquenil without azithromycin, which I think is completely appropriate. And that's because there is a very major risk with using hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin because both of the drugs have the potential for QT prolongation. And we know that there are some patients recently in the press that have actually taken chloroquine and they have died from cardiac arrhythmia secondary to the definitive QT prolongation. So these drugs are not without risk. So if you are going to use this combination, and honestly, if you're going to use Plaquenil or Azithromycin independently, there is some guidelines out there for you to risk assess what your patient is going to be going through as far as the risk of QT prolongation through the ACC. So this is the website that the ACC oftentimes refers to, and this is essentially the score that is eventually calculated to determine if your patient is going to be at risk for QT prolongation. You enter all this information, and then you decide if they're low risk, moderate risk, or high risk for QT prolongation. High risk, you really should consider not using this drug combination because it's gonna put your patients at unnecessarily um, more risk for complication than benefit. Usually what we consider high risk is greater than 11 points. They'll say that moderate risk is somewhere between seven and 10. When you start getting to that 10 side, you really have to maybe even have a risk benefit discussion with your patient to make a very educated decision about whether this is the appropriate treatment for your patient or not. So the next drug is uh, tocilizumab. And so tocilizumab is actually an IL-6 antagonist, 
We talked about IL-6 inflammatory markers and even sometimes checking these in both the PUI and the confirmed positive patient to try to determine where they are in their cytokine, st cytokine storm. So it makes sense why this drug generated so much popularity because it is an IL-6 antagonist. So in theory, it should help when we are in our cytokine storm. Uh, there is recommendation to use this drug with severe COVID-19, and this still remains investigational, quite honestly, like all of the other drugs are at this point in time, and should be done under the auspices of a clinical trial. In preliminary data from a non-peer-reviewed single-arm Chinese trial involving 21 patients with severe critical COVID, patients did demonstrate fever reduction and a reduced need for supplemental oxygen within several days after receiving this drug. It was initially given as a 400 milligram dose by IV infusion, and then this dose was repeated every repeated within 12 hours in three patients um, because of continued fever. And so tocolizumab and serolumab are both IL-6 antagonists. What I caution you guys on is both both of them actually have a black box warning for serious risk of infections, including tuberculosis and other opportunistic infections. Patients with either treatment should be tested for latent tuberculosis prior to discharge from the hospital and followed up in the TB clinic if that testing is positive. So you give them a essentially an immune modulating drug when they may already be sick. So there is a lot of concerns about whether this is going to progress to a pneumonic type process. So understandably, they might be in the cytokine storm. In theory, it seems like we should potentially give them an IL-6 antagonist, but I, we just don't know what the outcomes are gonna be if we're actually implementing a drug like this um, during a patient's condition that's already critical from a viral illness. So again, one of the drugs that we're definitely closely watching, and I put this slide in here because this has gained a lot of popularity as we start talking about the cytokine storm. You can see we talk about the severity of illness where patients are kind of mild and the clinical symptoms, yeah, they've got a fever, they may have got some dry cough, some headaches, some diarrhea, they've got some lymphopenia. And a lot of times we just try to support the patients through this phase. And then all of a sudden they start progressing if they hit that biphasic modality of this disease process and they start becoming progressively more hypoxic, requiring more intensive need. And then we talk about going into the cytokine storm, which really is toward the latter end of this continuum where they start developing ARDS, shock, cardiac failure, et cetera. And that is really hallmarked by these elevated inflammatory markers, including the IL-6. So you can see why individuals got really interested in giving corticosteroids and IL-6 inhibitors um, during this period where they would consider the cytokine storm. So I like this chart because it explains really well about what's going on physiologically with this patient, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that we give antagonists to patients that are succumbing to septic shock from a viral illness. You know, we don't do that with things like the flu. We don't do that with things like the measles. And so we've got to be very, very careful. You know, we're applying these drugs, like I told you, everybody's looking for their interest into their market and to be kind of the savior of this pandemic. But we have to be careful about the drugs we're choosing and why, and really observe whether they are actually having a beneficial effect or not. So next drug that kind of got a lot, a lot of notoriety in the beginning of the pandemic is called remdesivir. So remdesivir was actually discovered by Gilead and the Army Institute during the Ebola outbreak. It was not successful there. Uh, remdesivir is a nucleotide prodrug that's metabolized to an analog of adenosine triphosphate, which inhibits viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is great because this is an RNA virus. However, there's really not adequate enough evidence for remdesivir against SARS-CoV in vivo. There was one case report that had been published early on with the use of remdesivir in a 35-year-old male who improved uh, one day after res uh, remdesivir was initiated, but it's really unclear if it was the drug or if this was just the disease following its natural course. Animal models have shown reduced lung viral loads when remdesivir is used for both SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV. Um, and you know, it's interesting because coronaviruses are a little smarter than the other RNA viruses. They are the only ones with the polymerase that can fix errors in their genome, meaning they can spot and ignore the mimics that drug hunters typically design. Remdesivir has been kind of targeted to work around that, which is why it really gained a lot of popularity. 
but we still don't know. Uh, there was a most recent uh, article published in the New England Journal of Medicine was actually pretty appalling and you guys should review it at your own leisure. It was not the article that was quite as appalling, but it was the editorial that came out stating the 11 reasons why the drug trial was very inappropriately done. So this was a trial that had about 61 patients in it. And so at the end of the day, they said, hey, this drug super, super worked, but then they started listing the 11 reasons why this trial really shouldn't be what clinicians hang their hat on to actually use this drug at their will. And so just a couple of things uh, on post-op day number one, and I use the word post-op, but post-infusion day number one, seven people were dropped out from the trial. Why? Nobody knows why those individuals were dropped out of the trial. Did they die? Did they withdraw? Did they have a severe complication? Nobody wise. Then there was no predefined endpoints. Well, that's interesting because almost every single trial is required to have an endpoint, but there were no specific endpoints that we could actually target. They just said that they did better. Uh, so no endpoints, no outcomes, and there was no information about biomarkers. Well, we just said the second phase of COVID is really the cytokine storm, which we look at all of these inflammatory markings, the ferritin, the LDH, the CPK, the IL-6, but none of that information was actually included. And so they really did a very good job of listing 11 reasons why, even though this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, there were 11 reasons why we had to really look at this article and this trial critically. And I would actually encourage you to read this because you should remember those 11 reasons when you're looking at other treatment options to see if the trial had any level of rigorousness to it to really determine safety and efficacy of the drug. So in a nutshell, remdesivir, everyone's really hopeful about remdesivir. I, I don't know if remdesivir is gonna have its day with COVID. Um, I think that we're still just gonna have to track it and see what other drug trials do and other drug trials prove as far as remdesivir is concerned. What I will tell you is that it is only available through compassionate use. And there is, I believe, an expanded drug protocol. And this has really been limited to patients who are severely ill and potentially on the ventilator that can actually receive remdesivir. It shouldn't be used if creatinine clearance falls below 30 milliliters per minute, and it cannot be continued if ALT goes above five times the upper limit of normal. So next thing that has come to the stage is convalescent plasma. So what is convalescent plasma? Convalescent plasma is plasma of individuals that have successfully recovered from the virus. And so when we recover from viruses, we develop antibodies. And so those antibodies, in theory, can be transfused to patients who have not mounted that antibody response as of yet. So that makes sense. It has been used in the past. It has been used in the measles epidemic. It was used in SARS-CoV. It was used in MERS. It was used in the Spanish flu of 1918. And it has demonstrated quite a bit of success in those conditions. And so makes sense. I mean, in the physiology, absolutely makes sense about it being able to be used in a virus that's similar to this. So there are a couple different trials that are going on right now. Uh, there's a very big trial that's being sponsored by Mayo Clinic and the Red Cross to try to collect convalescent plasma from patients who have recovered and infusing it in those that are either severely ill or critically ill. And so how do we do find severely ill and critically ill. Severely ill patients usually have a respiratory rate greater than 30. They have dyspnea. They have a PaO2, FiO2 ratio of greater than 300. They have a chest x-ray that within 24 to 48 hour involves 50% of the lungs bilaterally with infiltrates. To be critical, those individuals have to have multi-system organ failure, respiratory failure by ventilatory support, or septic shock. Those are the individuals that they're really targeting as far as transfusing convalescent plasma to. So how do you donate convalescent plasma, which I think is probably important to talk about, is the patients have to be at minimum 14 days out from their illness. Between days 14 and days 28, they can have a, another test drawn to prove that they have cleared the virus. So a negative RT-PCR will make them eligible to donate plasma. They also have to improve in of their symptoms. If they wait 28 days, they don't have to have that negative RT-PCR. They can go ahead and they can donate plasma. 
we're using Oklahoma Blood Institute primarily because they service our region and we can ensure that those units of plasma will stay within the state of Oklahoma and be given to the patients that need it within our state. And so the evidence behind this, there was a case series published in JAMA that showed five patients who were critically ill with COVID-19 were treated with convalescent plasma. They were assessed by CT, viral load, uh, declination, and clinical conditions, including an improvement in their temperature, as well as the PaO2 and the FiO2, as well as chest imaging. Uh, four patients who had been receiving mechanical ventilation ECMO no longer required respiratory support by nine days after plasma transfusion. Um, However, all patients were treated with multiple other agents, including antiviral medications, so it's really not possible to determine whether an improvement could have been related to plasma therapies or other. Um, the plasma was also transfused between 10 and 22 days after admission, and really determining whether a different timing of administration would have been associated with even better, better outcomes really can't be determined. I will tell you that convalescent plasma is not currently supported by the sepsis guidelines, um, and there was another recent trial that came out that also showed improvement in respiratory parameters, and that involved about 11 patients or so. So it's gaining a little bit of ground. It has a little bit of track history with viral type illnesses. So I think that its entry into stage may, may be worth watching. Um, are there some risks with it? Absolutely. This is transfusing plasma to somebody. We know that we always talk about ABO incompatibility, and there is a risk of ABO incompatibility, but what they found is they can actually donate to individuals who might not have the specific blood type that is found within that plasma unit because the antibody titers are so darn low. So this becomes a discussion with the patient, again, kind of like we always talk about, there's risks and benefits, but these plasma units are so critical and they are so short that we have to be careful and we have to have these discussions with the patient because we don't ever want to waste one of these units of plasma. So next is vitamin C. Uh, vitamin C, you know, they talk about may reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation in critically ill patients. And this was something that was looked at way before COVID came onto stage. Um, it was actually based on eight studies, which was about roughly 685 patients. Um, and the research has found that vitamin C shortened the length of mechanical ventilation on average by 14%. However, by reviewing all of these studies, there was significant heterogeneity in the effect of vitamin C existing between all the trials. Um, so we know that it might not have done super in, in the past, but there is still some individuals that support using vitamin C in the patients that are profoundly sick with septic shock. I don't know if there's very much harm to adding vitamin C to the treatment regimen. And so you'll see oftentimes when patients are in septic shock, respiratory failure, a lot of times your pulmonologist and your critical care specialist are reaching for vitamin C just in adjunct. So what about zinc? Zinc's also an interesting uh, vitamin that kind of has a little bit of history um, and may have a little bit more of a role to play in uh, patients with COVID-19. There was a Cochrane review updated in 2013 that summarized 18 randomized control trials involving 1,781 participants across all age groups. What they ended up finding was that zinc, particularly logins or serot form, inhibited replication of viruses that cause the common cold and shortens average duration of the common cold if it's taken within 24 hours of symptom onset and with a very low dose of no more than 75 milligrams a day. On top of that, the combination of chloroquine with zinc actually enhanced chloroquine cytotoxicity and induced apoptosis in A27800 cells. Thus, they think that chloroquine, hey, this is a zinc ionophore, a property that may contribute to chloroquine's anti-cancer activity. And so kind of combining both of those two things make it seem like, hey, maybe if we add this to Plaquenil, it may be able to enhance Plaquenil's activity, plus we are going to get some of its inhibitory capacity as far as viral replication is concerned. So possibly using this um, for patients with covid may help. Now they're not saying co uh, they're not saying zinc nor vitamin C are actual treatments 
per se for COVID-19, but when used in adjunct with other treatment modalities, it may actually have a little bit of benefit. And again, we always look at risk versus benefit. Is there going to be a risk about giving patients supplemental vitamin C and zinc? I would suggest the answer is probably no, as long as you're giving it for short terms. Um, and if it gives a little bit of added benefit, it may be worth it. So next was lupinavir or ritonavir, or sorry, lupinavir slash ritonavir, and we all know this as Kaletra, came really, really early in the pandemic, and everybody was very interested in its activity. Probably the most notable research was published in a recent randomized control open label trial, which looked at lupinavir uh, ritonavir versus standard of care. So the Kaletra arm had 99, the standard of care had 100 in SARS-CoV-2 uh, patients and it showed no association with a difference in time to clinical improvement or mortality. There are still individuals that are participating in ongoing trials with Kaletra, but really none of the other results are available and really didn't show that much of a benefit. So next is one of the newer players to the market. It's called baricitinib. And so baricitinib is a JAK inhibitor. And why are JAK inhibitors playing a role? Well, if we go back to this slide, we talk about that whole cytokine storm. And if you look at the very bottom, you can see JAK inhibitors, where they think this drug is gonna play a role again, is most likely in this cytokine storm when patients are getting uh, acutely ill. So the theory behind JAK inhibitors is that it reduces or interrupts the passage of the virus into target cells and it may inhibit the JAK1 and JAK2 mediated cytokine release. The real safety profile of this drug remains to be definitively clarified because the original studies when you were looking at this drug for separate disease processes showed an increased risk of herpes zoster and simplex infection, which was found in the development of this drug in comparison to placebo. And so again, here we are with the IL-6s and the JAK inhibitors, are we going to potentially induce more harm? Sure, we might stop the inflammatory cascade, but maybe these inflammatory cascades are not unique to COVID. Maybe it is robust in COVID, but it was probably the same type of inflammatory cascade that we see in a lot of septic shock patients. We don't give those septic shock patients drugs that are potentially, potentially immunosuppressive. And you can make the argument, well, yeah, we sometimes give steroids, but there are a lot of different reasons for steroids these drugs are a little bit different. I, I feel like they definitely may have a role, but it really should be done in conjunction with infectious disease consultation if the choice is to be implementing these type of drug therapies. In addition, IDSA or the Infectious Disease Society of America has recommended that essentially for any drug that is being considered for the treatment of COVID, should be done in the context of a clinical trial. And so that's a pretty strong statement from the IDSA. And they say that about all the drugs across the board. They say about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. They say it about baricitinib. They say it about essentially any drug that has come to market. It should be done in the context of a clinical trial. So the next thing that we're going to talk about a little bit is acetazolamide, nifedipine, and PDE inhibitors and whether they should be used as an adjunct countermeasure in the treatment of COVID 2019. So it's interesting, and this was really looked at, I'm pretty sure in Colorado, both COVID-19 and HAEP, so that's high altitude pulmonary edema, they both exhibit a decreased ratio of arterial oxygen, uh, partial pressure to fractional inspired oxygen with concomitant hypoxia and tachypnea. There also appears to be a tendency for low carbon dioxide levels in both groups as well. So the HAEP groups as well as the COVID groups. Both of them end up showing radiographic findings of ground glass opacities. Um, patients with HAPE also exhibit patchy infiltrates, just like we see with COVID-19. They both have elevated fibrinogen levels, and they have this if you'll call it an epiphenomenon of edema formation rather than actual coagulation acti uh, activation. Autopsy results of COVID-19 um, revealed these bilateral diffuse alveolar damage associated with pulmonary edema, pro-inflammatory concentrates, and indications of early phase acute respiratory distress syndrome. It, so you can see there are a lot of similarities between COVID-19 patients and HAPE. There's some speculation that maybe 
because we've already talked about the physiology as how these patients, yeah, they look like they have ARDS, but it's not really 100% consistent with ARDS. So there's a group that's saying, hey, maybe it's not ARDS and it resembles more high altitude pulmonary edema. It's a little hard for me to buy that because high altitude pulmonary edema has a very distinct physiology based on being at high altitude. And so it's really hard for me to buy that they have the same exact physiology and the same exact alveolar membrane permeability because the underlying physiologies are obviously very different. Patients in Oklahoma are not at high altitude. So there's some discussion about, hey, maybe we should give them acetazolamide. Ugh. I have a little bit of reluctance to give patients acetazolamide. Yes, I want to keep them on the dry side. A lot of times these patients have a depressed bic uh, bicarbonate. They have elevated lactic acid. We know that acetozolamide, it functions to essentially act as a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and can make you even more acidotic. And so I, I, I would use this drug I would use this drug with caution. Um, I don't think it has a role here yet, but it is something that is definitely being looked at. The other thing is we know that acetazolamide was looked at in COPD patients. You know, everybody was thinking, hey, acetazolamide effectively decreases the level of serum bicarbonate and the number of days with metabolic alkalosis in critically ill patients with COPD. But you know what? It didn't produce statistically significant differences in the duration of mechanical ventilation. Although that study lacks statistical significance because it was probably an underpowered study, it, it's still one of those things that, hey, it didn't do so well here. Hey, the physiology is really different between high altitude pulmonary edema and COVID. So is it really going to be a player on the stage? I, I'm assuming not, but it is something that we're still continuing to watch. Probably the newest player is the parasite drug called ivermectin. And there has been a lot of discussion about this drug. Um, it has been widely used for decades. It was introduced as a veterinary drug in the 1970s. Doctors also use it to prescribe for head lice, scabies, other infections caused by parasites. And according to a report published online in the Journal of Antiviral Research, the drug quickly prevented replication of SARS-CoV-2 in a lab. Um, researchers infected cells with SARS-CoV-2, then exposed them to ivermectin, and they found that a single dose of ivermectin killed COVID-19 in a petri dish within 48 hours, indicating potent antiviral activity. Here's the caveat. Yes, we reviewed the study. The study did prove that ivermectin killed COVID in a petri dish. At and all the investigators say 100% this is a lead that should be investigated. But what everyone really needs to know is can you translate that concentra concentration, so the concentration that they used in the Petri dish, can you translate that into human studies and is it going to be safe? That is what we don't know. So everybody gets this interest in using the same dosing that's being used to being treat kids with head lice to treat COVID. And I think the, the reasoning there is faulty. We don't know what concentration it's going to take to really do this in a human patient. And so just taking a little bit of ivermectin here and there is probably not what's recommended. I think it needs more study. And here's a perfect thing. And this actually unfortunately happened quite a bit in Oklahoma was we find that doctors and pharmacists start stockpiling these COVID-19 drugs and it's becoming a problem. And so they published this on April 1st and they stated, we are aware that some physicians and others are prophylactically prescribing medications identified as potential treatments, such as chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and then prescribing it for themselves and their families or their colleagues. Um, some pharmacies and hospitals have been purchasing excessive amounts of these medications in anticipation of possibly using them for COVID-19 prevention and treatment. And really, this came out from the colleges of pharmacy. They are strongly opposing these type of actions. In the March 24th New York Times, there was an article that indicated that stockpiling became such a concern in Idaho, Kentucky, Ohio, Nevada, Oklahoma, North Carolina, and Texas that they actually had to use, issue emergency restrictions or guidelines on how pharmacies can dispense the drugs. 
And that's unfortunate because, you know, you think about it, there are individuals who have rheumatoid arthritis and Plaquenil who actually, or sorry, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus who actually depend on drugs like Plaquenil and we are stockpiling them personally because we may or may not get COVID. Um, and we are writing prescriptions, such a large number that we can treat all of our friends, all of our colleagues and our families, and you're prohibiting the ability of patients who actually needed to actually receive the drug. So this is a problem. Don't do it. It's, it's poor form. So steroids, <clears throat> we kind of talked again about that one slide that I showed way back when about the cytokine storm that happens in that biphasic period of illness. And so where do steroids play a role? And so this came out of the SCCM guidelines. What they say is for adults with COVID-19 and refractory shock, yes, go ahead using low dose corticosteroid therapy over no corticosteroid therapy, which is no different than what we typically do in septic shock patients. However, a typical corticosteroid regimen in septic shock is 200 milligrams per day um, broken up in intermittent doses. And so here they're recommending about 50 milligrams IVQ six hours at most, which again, of course, equals to the 200 milligrams. In mechanically ventilated patients and respiratory failure without ARDS, they are not supporting the use of uh, systemic corticosteroids contrary to when patients are diagnosed with COVID and ARDS, they are suggesting that you can use systemic corticosteroids. Um, this isn't too different than what we typically do with the patients that we have on the ventilator for septic shock. Steroids aren't usually our first arm. We use it after we've adequately resuscitated the patient. They are not getting better. They're persistently shocky. A lot of times we'll add the steroids in conjunction with our vasopressor and our volume resuscitation. Same thing, we don't put every single patient that is has, re has had respiratory failure immediately on steroids. We use We do it based on our clinical judgment and essentially they're saying, it doesn't change. What we're doing right now for the COVID patients is not really different than what we do for our typical septic shock patients. So DIC or hypercoagulable, this is another area that's getting a lot of attention. And the ISTH, which is the International Society of Thrombosis, actually put out this guidance on recognizing and managing coagulopathy in COVID-19 type patients. Based on this study and the experience from the published literature on septic coagulopathy, monitoring PT, D-dimers, platelet counts, fibrinogens can be helpful in determining prognosis of COVID-19 patients. If there's worsening of these parameters, more aggressive critical care support is warranted. Consideration could be given to, quote, experimental, end quote, therapies and blood product support as, as appropriate. The only widely suggested treatment for these patients currently is prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin. And they recommend that for all patients who are critically ill with COVID-19. Again, not too different than what we're doing with most septic patients. We knew that they fall in high risk. If there's not a compelling contraindication, we usually give prophylactic low molecular weight heparin or heparin for these patients. So they say any patient who's requiring hospitalization for COVID in the absence of contraindications, which is active bleeding in a platelet count less than 25,000 um, or severe renal impairment should get low molecular weight heparin as far as DVT prophylaxis is concerned. They do say bleeding is rare in the setting of COVID, um, even with some thrombocytopenia, which you may be seeing secondary to the sepsis. Um, there is a potential for DIC, again, not too different than what we see in normal septic patients. You get overwhelming septic. There is a possibility for developing DIC. This is not any different than what we traditionally see right now. So then that goes to, does everybody get antibiotics who has COVID-19? And so the recommendation from the SCCM is in mechanically ventilated patients and respiratory failure, they do support the use of empiric antibiotics over no antimicrobials. They also suggest that it should be assessed every day for de-escalation, and so that we are not just bombarding these patients with antibiotics unnecessarily. Clinical reports indicate that the rates of bacterial superinfection of COVID-19 are actually pretty low, 10 to 20%, but when they are present, they substantially increase the mortality risk. 
anecdotal reports suggest that the MRSA superinfection is actually seen less often with influenza and that unnecessary antibiotics actually carry the risk of fluid overload and drug resistance, as well as the possibility that antibiotics, antibiotics may themselves become a limited resource. Data from critically ill patients demonstrated the secondary infection in about 11% of the cases, although the numbers were small, um, showed isolated gram-negative organisms such as Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, and serratia. So on the basis of limited data, it's difficult to determine patterns of superinfection, including the risk of staph um, with COVID-19 patients and hypoxic respiratory failure. Again, SCCM recommends when you're being mechanically ventilated that they do support the use of appropriate antibiotic therapy. So antibiotics, they strongly recommend, should reflect IDSA guidelines. Um, and so if the patient is without risk factors or MRSA, um, or pseudomonas, you really should consider doing what you typically do for community-acquired pneumonia, which is usually rocephin and azithromycin. If patients have risk factors for MRSA or pseudomonas, um, you can always do what we traditionally do is starting with vancomycin and cefepime plus consideration for atypical coverage with either azithromycin, doxycycline, or fluoroquinolones. Again, I put the caveat in, if they've got a prolonged QT, you've got to be careful with drugs like fluoroquinolones and azithromycin because they're notorious for causing prolonged QTs. They do have a prolonged QT, of course, reach for doxycycline. There's also a score that's been put out and has been kind of recommended for COVID patients um, only because they are trying to veer away from the use of just empiric vancomycin because of the risk of nephrotoxicity, particularly when given with uh, Zosim. Um, it's called the SHORE score. So S-H-O-R-R -R score. Uh, it was original study by Shore et al. It looked at retrospective patients, uh, about 5,975 of them that are admitted for pneumonia at 62 hospitals in the U.S. Um, and it essentially has a very strong negative predictive value. So if the score indicates that the patient doesn't have a high risk for MRSA, it gives you a lot of reassurance that maybe we don't need to be covering these individuals with vancomycin or linazolid um, for an MRSA type infection. So useful, again, using clinical judgment, scores aren't the end all be all, but sometimes help us when we are kind of on the fence about things. So what about hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Um, again, very, very anecdotal evidence for uh, hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy being a treatment option based on its previous experience during SARS-CoV. So hyperbarics is an emergency investigational device for treating patients with novel COVID-19, obviously, because it's not an established treatment. It's actually being studied in New York. In New York, what they're doing is they're placing the individuals into a monoplace chamber, um, and they are giving them a 90 minute therapy with hyperbaric oxygen at two atmospheres. Um, they are suggesting that additional treatments up to five can be given if warranted and agreed upon by the patient, all members of the team. So it's interesting because this actually got its, I guess you could say its background because it was used um, by a physician um, long ago who tried it on one patient and had pretty good success. It wasn't associated with SARS-CoV and it's escaping me what they treated their patient for. Um, but in theory, remember we talk about the happy hypoxic patient. If the biggest problem those individuals are having is hypoxia, in theory it would make sense to provide them with very concentrated levels of oxygen to see if we could improve that state per se, and prevent them from progressing to uh, ventilatory need. And so again, is being investigated. We are actually looking at that here at Oklahoma State University. We're looking at a trial which will look at hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin plus hyperbarics versus maybe hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin alone. So now just for a couple of other things that maybe controversial, if you will. You know, initially there was a lot of discussion about holding ACEs and ARBs. And the reason there was all this discussion was that SARS-CoV-2 uh, enters via the same cell entry as the angiotensin converting enzyme. Um, and we can then kind of deduce that, well, 
if this ACE2 is expressed in the heart, lungs, vasculature, kidneys, could medications like ACE inhibitors and ARBs worsen myocarditis or precipitate um, ACS and cause upregulation of ACE2? Um, and then maybe ARBs might be a little bit uh, protective. So no one really knows. The ACC and the AHA came out very strongly that they recommend against discontinuing patients if they are already on this medication. The caveat there is if they're not on the medication, it may be wise not to start the medication in the midst of a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So again, ACC and AHA, AHA say, listen, don't stop your ACE and ARB if you're already on it. If the patient is not on it, it may be wise not to implement therapy in the midst of a SARS-CoV-2 infection. What about ibuprofen? Again, very similar as far as the ACE2 entry being upregulated by ibuprofen in animal models. And maybe this is linked to worsening pathology. The World Health Organization or the WHO recommends not avoiding NSAIDs. That's not saying, hey, go give everybody NSAIDs because this is going to be a great thing, but they have come out and said that they don't recommend avoiding NSAIDs during this period of time. And so now just a couple of things, a lot of questions that we always get and you'll hear a lot about in the medium. Is the virus mutating? And if it mutates, and oh my gosh, if it mutates really fast, is this going to be something that's completely uncontrollable? So here's what we know. The SARS-CoV-2 virus is an RNA virus. It's like the flu. It's like measles. They are prone to changes and mutations when you compare them with DNA viruses like herpes and smallpox and HPV. In the world of RNA viruses, change is actually the norm. We expect RNA viruses to change frequently. That is their nature. SARS-CoV is no exception. And over the past few months, it has been mutating. The, but the virus is actually mutating at a very, very slow pace. And when it does mutate, the new copies, they're really not far off from the original virus. So the sequences of the original isolates from China are actually very close to those that are circulating in the US and the rest of the world. So yes, are they going to mutate? 100% they're gonna mutate, but they're mutating at a rate as to which they're not a new virus every time they actually develop. So what does this mean for a vaccine? Because that's where everybody gets a little bit flipped out is, oh my gosh, this is mutating so fast, there's not actually gonna be an amenable vaccine for this infection. So, The bottom line is mutations will likely not interfere with the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine. It's slow, it's mild in nature, and that's as good news for developing a vaccine. The virus is so similar now to the initial sequence that we are not worried about the differences as we are developing vaccines. We look at, and then we look at the flu. The H1N1 annual vaccine is still using a strain from 2009. We also talk about the measles vaccine. So when you look at the measles vaccine, the measles vaccine hasn't mutated enough for us to be changing the vaccine every single year. And so will there be some mutations? Yes. Is it going to prohibit us from developing a vaccine? The short answer is no. We think, or most of the experts think, I should say, an older strain of the virus will preserve enough features that'll provide immunity against a whole group of variants. And so that really concludes where we are. Um, just another caveat as far as the vaccine. I, I say that, yes, there's a lot of hope. Yes, they've actually trialed giving the first vaccine in experimental type situations. We shouldn't hold our breath that that's gonna be something that's available in the next three months. They are talking about 12 to 18 months until we actually have a vaccine that's readily available to deploy. My hope is that that is sooner than that but we really don't know the answers to that at this point in time. So what does that mean for now? And what does it mean as far as treatment modalities? It means that treatment modalities are being introduced and changed every single day. Like I said, in the very beginning of this lecture, it is super important for us to have heightened vigilance about what's being used, how it's being used, and what we should be doing personally. Things like stockpiling and hoarding and all those types of things is really probably not appropriate. And exactly like what happened with plaquenil and 
azithromycin, you know, was touted by the White House and multiple other individuals, and everybody thought that this combination was going to be our savior. And now there are some studies that saying, hey, well, it's not maybe as working as well it was. And then the other arm saying, well, no, it was, and your studies are as bad as our studies. We just don't know. And so we have to be vigilant and we have to be reading every single day and we have to be taking these findings with a grain of salt and really looking at how these study the drug as far as safety and efficacy is concerned. Um, so my hope is that there is going to be a treatment modality that's available and safe and efficacious. Um, I don't know how quickly we're going to actually be able to see that. Um, but I am hopeful. And so that is kind of a very short overview of what is currently available and what's currently being looked at and what we should be watching as it comes down the pike. Um, and with that, I will conclude um, this series. Thank you.